Okay. Well, welcome everyone to the Society of Scribes presentation of the wonderful Margaret Morgan from Derbyshire, England. Uh, lives near the city of Buxton. And um, I met Margaret six years ago in London, and we've become pretty fast friends via Zoom. And we both belong to the Black Letter Brunch, sponsored by the Friends of Calligraphy in San Francisco. And it was last year that Margaret gave this particular talk for the Friends. And I was so blown away by it, as was everybody else, that I said, we have to get Margaret to New York. So here she is. And there are several people who took the presentation in California last year who have signed up for this as well. But before we get started on that, I just have to do a little bit of housekeeping for the Society of Scribes. Be very brief. We're always looking for new board members. So if anybody is interested in becoming one, please do let us know. Just shoot us an email or send it to the Society of Scribes website and uh, we'll take it from there. We are looking for, rather urgently, a social media techie, somebody who can really post things on Instagram, Facebook, and various other uh, sites. That's really rather important. And I know it's difficult to get. People have their own responsibilities and obligations. But if anybody feels really competent to do that, we would really appreciate hearing from you. The Holiday Fair, which has been an annual, <laughs> excuse me, which has been an annual tradition since the year of the flood, <clears throat> is tentatively scheduled for December 2nd. We do need volunteers. So if you're interested in functioning in some capacity, please do let us know and let us know what area you would like to work in, whether it's uh, providing cookies or uh, contacting other calligraphers to be presenters at the fair, that would be great. And I think that is it as far as housekeeping goes. Yeah, so everybody is muted. If there are questions, and I'm sure there will be, please put them in the chat and they'll be fielded after Margaret's presentation. Oh, one last thing. As probably most of you know, Margaret will also be doing a four-part workshop for the Society starting on September 9th. Now, it's September 9th, the 10th, the 16th, and the 23rd, roughly two-hour sessions of each. There will be some homework, and Margaret will be able to look at everybody's work and guide you. Now, on the uh, announcement of this, it said September 17th. That went up before the date was changed. So September 17th is now September 16th. That's the only change in effect. The other three dates stay put. And after the presentation, Margaret will graciously tell us all a little bit about the workshop. I do have to tell you that it is limited to only 12 participants so if you're interested, sign up right away. The information will be up on our website very soon. Okay, so with that, Margaret, take it away. Ah. Right. Gosh, spotlight is on me. <laughs> um, the book I'm going to show you started as an exercise with a Zoom workshop in December 2021 with a group of friends which was led by Josie Brown, whom some of you may know. Um, we were going to be making a Japanese, Japanese butterfly binding book with a folded wrap cover and a slip case to finish the job off neatly. The group was made up of mostly experienced calligraphers, but hesitant in that they had um, little or unhappy bookbinding experience. And I'm sure there's a few of you out there who will understand the unhappy business. Um, several people, uh, the tutor included, disliked sewing in general, but especially in bookbinding. 
Others hated measuring and cutting paper, as it often turned out to be inaccurate. Uh, these concerns were going to be addressed at drawing attention to detail. But what we were all looking for um, was an effective and efficient way of putting pages together that didn't require a lot of specialist kit. And again, I'm sure many of you understand that if, if you do bookbinding properly, you need another room. And I haven't got one, so <laughs> um, that's why I was interested. It was very simple sewing in, uh, involved, just four needles, one on each end of two long threads. Um, linen thread was recommended because it's it's stronger than things like uh, ordinary cotton or um, silk thread. The method appealed to me particularly because it allows you to collect very different papers together into sections so that as long as each section of however many pages is, is matched in thickness, um, you know, you can get more thin sheets than thick sheets of paper, and I will show you that shortly. Um, as long as it's roughly even, you're fine. So you can just about put anything into a book. There were one or two other uh, little tricks that Josie had up her sleeve, like fold outs so that you get even more pages in, cut outs, little windows so that you could highlight special features on following or forthcoming pages and pockets. But I haven't used all of those, just some of them in this particular book. It's a great method for putting together a blank journal um, or a notebook or a sketchbook where you've got, as I've already described, different kinds of paper that you want to use. And normally when you make a book of this nature, all the pages have to be the same. So being perverse, it did appeal to me particularly. I decided that for um, an experiment, I wasn't going to waste good paper and I hate writing into pre-bound books. So rather than raiding my plan chest downstairs for the likes of some Saunders Waterford or BFK Reeve to make a, a dummy book, I would use up any scraps I could lay my hands on around the studio. And I've been, I had been trying to tidy things up for a good while. Um, not with any great degree of success because you know, work comes along and it tends to get in the way of tidying up. Um, what's more appealing, work or tidying? No contest, really. So this was a very good excuse for raiding my wads of envelopes full of practice sheets. Some that I couldn't bear to part with, but I knew also had errors in, I'm sure I could find ways of using them. So if I show you just a quick visual of my starting point. These are the two finished articles. You will see them shown in, in detail very shortly, but I thought you'd like to see the two finished and clean. I mean, I've, I've fiddled about with these books quite often, so they're getting a bit rough around the edges now. So I'll swap this, stop this share and go to my document camera and change it to there we are, this view. Now, this is my first attempt. First mistake, don't cut your tab to pull the book out with too short, <laughs> as I found out later. So here we are. This illustrates perfectly what I've got in the way of 
papers, you can see there, there's a beginning section and an ending section, which are all blank, um, but they allow you to tuck your blank sheets into the folded wrap cover. And I'll go into that more with the actual book that I want to show you in detail. You can see the first section there is just any old bits of drawing paper with things on upside down they may be. But the next section is just eight pages, two sheets of paper folded in half. Note the blanks, those come up next. And the main thrust of this book was to work in sections of 12 pages. So three sections, three pages of rubbish, basically, um, folded and put together in sections. Some of them are shorter. Some of them have thick, one thicker paper. This one at the end has one lovely bit of real scrap. This was some wrapping paper, I think from an Amazon parcel um, that had been screwed up, but it looked interesting for writing on. So I borrowed it and tried it out and thought it would be a good opportunity to try binding it into this book. It even has folds so I could tear it if I wanted to. You'll note that the um, stitching is what I would describe as um, less than taut, so it wobbles about quite a lot, but that's a good reason for not using really good paper when you're making dummies to try out the stitching techniques. That's volume one. Some years ago, I heard, I learned from Thomas Ingmeyer that it was an interesting exercise to investigate the possibilities of combining throwaways into book form. And this same topic cropped up in a Zoom lecture that he gave for Friends of Calligraphy a couple of years ago, which tickled my imagination somewhat not knowing quite how to use it or where I was going to find these pieces of paper. But the idea of seeing what textural or layout ideas were possible with completely odd or unexpected juxtapositions of images using real scrap paper, like that previously screwed up packing paper, seem to offer a way into making a second volume using more practice sheets with whatever script or technique I'd been trying out and couldn't bear to throw away, as they contained elements that pleased me whilst also having quite a few errors, lines through them scribbled out with one a pen or a brush because they weren't right and annoyed me. So I collected all sorts of stuff together, swapping and changing many times over how the pages were paired up, which right way the writing would sit, which areas of colour might work best with blocks of writing, and things like that. And it was inevitable it would be quite a few blank pages and they could be single or even double across the middle um, of the section. And these would pose entirely new and different problems that required some sort of resolution because it seemed a shame to leave them just plain. Volume two became a challenge. I needed to fill those blank pages either to complement or contrast what was already there. And doing this before the binding process seemed a more sensible way to proceed. 
it meant I could also review each spread to see if enhancing the original pages in some way may, might make the spreads even better, more coherent, and start to make some sense with a kind of theme that would develop through the course of the book. There were no rules to help me decide how to do this. So what was added, whether it was on facing pages or across empty double pages, was done entirely intuitively, you know, asking myself questions, what would work, what would be silly, but might be worth trying, who knows. I wanted to try and find perhaps a colour that would run through the whole system, um, giving some unity right the way through the book. But again, oh, I was thinking, what tool could I use? What colour or technique? And if I did start to use colour, um, would I use ink, paint, gouache, graphite, coloured pencils or collage? Mm, that was something I'd not really tried very much before. But what really led me onwards was the thought I, that I could indulge myself by devising entirely new ideas for those empty spreads, um, giving myself carte blanche in terms of concept or execution. And given that this was in January 2022, with really dismal weather, I was just getting over a bad cold. So I kind of locked myself away in the studio for quite some time to devise this book and finish it. For inspiration, I turned to my own work. I've got sketchbooks to my left and right, left and right, uh, um, and borrowed a few ideas from Instagram harnessing all sorts of tools that I could find around the studio, including some very odd things that will crop up as we go through the book itself. My initial thought was that it wouldn't take very long at all to finish, it may be a couple of days. Um, but in actual fact, it turned out to be a much longer, more thoughtful, and inevitably fruitful process than I had imagined. I had to think very long and hard about each decision. And even though I might have been sure <laughs> or not that my initial intuition was right, I wanted to test my reasoning for each choice before I actually committed myself and sewed all the pages together. So I had to ask myself every time, what's my intention with this? What am I trying to do with it? Mm. And there wasn't always an answer, so use your intuition. So here we are, here's volume two. And I'll work through it slowly and show you, first of all, how this folded cover is devised. This is the same at both ends. I can't quite show you the whole thing on my camera. I can't get the, get the document camera up high enough. But it's a simple GF Smith pastel paper with a thin sheet of card folded inside to keep the cover rigid. And that's the same at the other end. And this little bit here holds the first two pages of the blank section in place. So when you've finished it, you can tuck those two pages into that fold. I won't do it now, it'll take too long. It's a bit of a fiddle. So working through the blank sections. The very first page is a piece of 
old paperback book that had fallen apart. You know what perfect binding is like. It's so perfect, it all the pages fall out after a few years. And this particular one was Alastair McLean's Break Heart Pass with a photograph of Charles Bronson on the front. I've kept the cover, but the, the bits are all over the place. And most of them end up in this. I've lost my share now. Somehow. There we go. Oh, hang on. I need to go back to my document camera view. I must have touched something I shouldn't have. It came out of this bit box, as you can see, bits of text. This Things out of here crop up throughout the book, but that's where the, it came from. I'd been using it to do collages where I was blanking out the text, but also cutting things out and using odd words in the same collage. And this one just happened to look like a letter C, which I thought would be a good opening. Here, this first spread is two sheets, but a lot of pages. The first and last page are BFK Reeve, where I was trying out, um, I think it was this uh, round Tim's pen to do a Ben Shan style of lettering. On the other side, I was using these to, to do a more um, gestural kind of letter. But the center is actually quite thin sketching paper where I'd got a whole load of bits that I'd tried out on the inside, but also worked on the back some new stuff But as it happened, I wanted to start off the book with um, different landscapes and trying these shorter pages, um, pages of different dimensions. So here, as I open the first page, I've got part of the blank section. So that gives you one complete landscape with contrasts of weight of stroke and texture that's produced. Even though this is the same lettering as that, it starts to look different because you've got this very delicately written um, skinny uh, letter in between two bold pieces. And when you open this one up, you get a different viewpoint altogether. Piece of paper, Suminagashi paper, I think that is, with some gold in it. A different landscape altogether. So you can continue opening it this way and it changes again. But if you open it that way, it changes again. And again, fold it up and turn it over and you have another different landscape, different contrasts. But what you do have is a little shading or strip of this orangey red, which runs right the way through the whole thing. And that's where the, the theme or the meme, whatever you like to call it, of the book started to, to establish itself was how the colour could take your eye into each page, across each page and through into the next section, which is here. This was existing and the red splodge was existing. That was done with this large um, synthetic brush by 
twiddling it around on the paper to see what kind of marks it, it makes. And there are some more at the end of this section that are completely different. So to add to that simple, simple red blob, um, I used one of those, I think it was this one, the dagger version this time, to make these marks and wrote on it with a graphite pencil with a very finely written black letter. And it says, I know a bank where on the wild time blows. That's for you, Barry, especially. But what it does illustrate, if I come out, is what happens if you cover that up. So this was the sort of decision I was make, having to make when I got these pages paired together, feeling that there was something missing in each case. Yes, I'd got red and orange here. Yes, I'd got red and orange here because I've got some little bits of um, coloured pencil that I'd scribbled over the top of the gouache that I'd made these big marks with. So I rummaged in my trusty box and there are all sorts of offcuts. I don't throw anything away, you see, I just put it in the box and end up with all sorts of odd things that could be used. So I found, first of all, this piece of orange card was a cutout, but it needed then something over here to balance it. And I found a tiny little scrap. I don't know what, why I'd say that particularly, but it's a tiny scrap of a Japanese tissue with silk threads in it. And it recurs in other places in this book. So keep your eyes peeled for what happens with those. The next page, this was an exercise I'd done from a book about abstract painting as I was trying to loosen up my calligraphy. And it was instructing you to create a sort of rainbow using oil-based crayons, well, they're colored pencils, not watercolors, so that they would sit over the top and they wouldn't blend with each other particularly, but you would get some interesting textures and color juxtapositions. And to connect that with this, which was using the Tim's pen again, um, with thin letter forms, compressed, and broader, stronger marks, wider letter forms on this side. So I got my trusty rainbow pencil out and filled in a few gaps. It's wonderful what you can do in 10 minutes when you, you strike upon an idea. Oh, great, I can fill in a few of these and play with a, this tool which is great, but it's fairly limited in, in what it will do for you. And then using my pieces of white paper again, this was what I had. Color, color and fine forms, strong forms. It needed something over here, so Rip a corner off a piece of glossy magazine page with a rough tear and it kind of balances what's going on over here because this is, I was not pleased with that so I lodged it over with a brush and it does kind of balance across the two pages. This is actually the center, or working towards the center. Brush lettering practice with a flat brush. Nothing on this side at all. But I remembered that I'd been um, looking at the aftermath of Andrea Wunderlich's 
um, Who's Afraid of Rudolf Koch online for an American group, I do believe. Was it yours, Barbara? Society for Calligraphy? Well, it was it was one of the, the major societies. Um, and I'd been looking at my book about Rudolf Koch that I have and doing experiments with changing the texture and pattern by changing the tool. So I did the lettering, which you will see the right way around. It's all done with pencil. I cover that up. That was what I had. And I remembered that on the side of my filing cabinet, which sits next to my drawing board, I had these, which were strips of masking tape that I'd put round the edges of some abstract painting experiments I'd been doing, but couldn't bear to throw them away because they were far too interesting. Look at the textures that you get, not just from the tape itself, but from the paint that had gone over from the painting onto the tape. So I peeled a few of those off and tried to assemble them into some sort of landscape here. Let's zoom out again. So you can see the whole effect. The orange was already there, which was the reason for choosing it. So I introduced some of the, the color with one of these pencils again in strategic places, chosen incidentally by scribbling the color on tracing paper first and just tearing bits out and seeing where would be the best places to put the color, which would take your eye through the design. And that technique that I learned from Anne Heckel years and years ago, way back in the last century, has stood me in good stead many times since then. So I would pass that on to you if you haven't heard it. If not on tracing paper, then on bits of layout paper or drawing paper, where you can just tear, tear it out and place the colour spots where you think they will work best of all, which is what I did here too. Here, Next, in the centre of this section of 12 pages, is my spider's web. So this was entirely blank when I came to it, and I had no idea what I was going to do with it. Um, so I took a brush. It might have been a smaller version of this, but I'm not sure now. It's too long ago. And I had got some um, indigo mixed with, I think, ultramarine or Windsor Blue, I forget which, which had been diluted quite thoroughly. Um, but there were still little crusts, you know, what it's like when you reconstitute gouache. You get little crusts of colour left. So sometimes the brush will pick that colour up and give you a darker patch in the stroke. So that was part one, those blue marks. When that was dry, I created some wavy, loose wavy forms with a graphite pencil, which I then went over, I think, with this tool again, making varied marks, trying to lead your eye from thick to thin across so that when you get to this side your interest is it peaked into what comes next it's not a full stop a heavy mark at the beginning can lead you on into something one at the end will just stop the eye and to show you what i mean it finishes there it doesn't go anywhere after that which is why I ended it with it 
this way round. All part of the decision making. When I got those lines, I filled this with ink and just made asemic letter-like forms across. Some were compressed, as I got here. Some had big spaces in them. When that was dry, it was time to bring out the orange crayon again and figure out where I could do this kind of um, highlighting with spots of color. So that was fun. Now, back to that brush letter practice at the end of that section. Another piece of the masking tape there. And this is one of my collage pieces. So without it, there's definitely something missing. It was in the box. So I put it in there and just added a little scribble of colour around the outside. So it would look a little bit like a setting sun. What to do next? Because this page was entirely blank. So just dealt with two pages that were blank. What could I do here? That would take my eye from this side of the page to there, but without having a heavy mark. And I remembered that when I was in Germany some years ago, in this wonderful art shop called Bursner's outside Cologne, I found this tool. It's called a Varia tip made by Da Vinci. And it has two levels of bristle. One is quite thick. The other is a bit like razored hair, you know. Um, but it, it makes some very interesting marks if you use a, a dry brush technique with it. So all these drawn lines here are with this dragging this brush round in a twiddle, completely at random, um, just following my nose, if you like. Getting progressively paler grey as it goes down. So it's almost like um, a feature in the landscape. So carrying on this landscape idea, which is partly set with the format of the page, which incidentally is entirely uh, unintentional. It was just the way the pages were cut from the sheets um, across the width rather than across the depth and folded the other way. The quote is another one from Rudolf Koch. And it's a little bit like grass coming out of the earth on the top layer and maybe a layer of gravel or pebbles below the, the topsoil before it goes down into the, I don't know what's the, the terminology for the bit below the good stuff I've forgotten. Just a, an idea to play with. I thought it was an, an interesting change from what you've got here with the very strong marks to the very delicate marks here, but it still makes quite a, a movement across the page, taking you through to another page of colour scribbles, rainbow pencil, picking up the colours from here, but without something in this corner, it lacked um, a focal point. Yes, this was a focal point in itself, but it needed something, a kind of statement before the end of the page. And I found this, which was where the round shape came from that was here. And it made me think of 
a face. So it was like a very angry person. And this is the cloud of invective that he was shouting about. <laughs> You know, I was thinking of uh, ways of justifying my choices, um, why I'd done it. So this was creating the color balance and balancing the weight of the design here with this without making a complete stop. You've got a hop over behind this block of orange. And here is the end. Um, of the swirl of red using what was left of paint on the brush just to dab these marks, just to see what the brush could do. And I have more Rudolf Koch. Uh, it's, it must have been Andrea's influence. The making of letters in every form is for me the purest and greatest pleasure. Well, you get that kind of feeling, I hope, from looking at what's in this book. This is my favourite collection of pages here because I'm being cheeky with how I've made pages. This is cut out from a sketchbook page because I like the texture. Originally, it would have been the other way up so you could read it, but I decided the texture was more important than what it actually says. And I could use it to introduce um, color from page to page to page to take your eye through it. Again, it's another let's change the landscape by turning the page, partially obscuring the marks on this side. Here's that Japanese paper again with a very squashed uh, capital letter form in pencil here. And I wanted to connect the softness that I'd got in some of these marks with toning down the the boldness of these letter forms here in black, which were really very heavy. So I took two watercolor crayons. One is a, I think a soft gray, and the other is actually two, a red and an orange. And with these, I just licked my finger and smudged the color to soften it off where I'd overlaid the two. What was on here was this, those bits, and I cunningly managed to fold what was gestural forms on this page that would almost tie up with what I'd got on this page here, using the color, the rainbow pencil again. I think this is one of the pages I'm still not entirely happy with. It it lacks a bit of punch um, and I've still not decided whether I need to do anything with it or not. So you could say it's still a work in progress. This one was another blank double page in the center of the section. Again, using Tim's pen. The first part of the writing was the very large marks that march across the page. If I cover those up, you can see, well, it's a bit piecemeal, but it, it needed something, a different emphasis that wasn't in the same plane that would um, not just make a, a textural uh, impact on the design, but also um, 
a difference in movement from the horizontal to the vertical. So I decided to write some little bits of text in the gaps that I'd created with these swooping letter forms. And it reads top to bottom here and bottom to top there. So you can read it that way, that way, and that way. Color moves across from here. Um, this again was done with little pieces of uh, layout paper this time of this uh, crayon to plan where to put them. But it almost suggested itself. Um, you've got these little lips here and the E and the W. So I decided to go with that in the end. Now you can see where that those gestural marks come out the other side of the, the center section. And I used a tiny bit of um, orange paper there. And also you can see that there's a one there with this cutout form. I don't know what I cut off that page, but it's the other end of the strong black letter forms. I, th I find this one pretty exciting too, because you've got the, the fragile nature of the letter forms here, right smack up against the brush lettering, a sort of standing stones, mini stone henge without the tops on, with the um, tissue paper, and colored pencil over the top of it. Uh, cardi paper with graphite, which you can only see if I zoom in for you. You can see there's a couple of graphite lines there. And then these cutout shapes lead your eye into the next section and create another landscape on both sides. This is what I found most excite exciting about working in this way. You could create things that you don't normally find in, in ordinary, ordinary bound books. Um, this is an artist calligrapher's book. So you are in charge of the whole creative process. There's no restrictions on page size or whether the pages go from edge to edge each time. You can vary the whole thing. As long as there's a uniting factor, which in my case I felt was the colour that repeated itself or I helped it to repeat throughout the book. Another bit of magazine here. This one, I have a whole uninterrupted view of this page. I really wanted it to be a centre fold, but it just didn't work with the other pages that I'd got left to include in this particular book. And I wanted it to, um, I've got them in the middle. I wanted something else in the middle. And it meant that I could use this cutout. I'd taken something out of there for no apparent reason. And I found that if I put it in here, I could create a different vista when I turned the page over with these Merovingian compressed letter forms and gestural letter forms, which worked in a similar weight of line, but not a similar form of letter. These are much more open and curvy, whereas these are tightly compressed together. This entire landscape along the bottom of the page is more of these 
incredibly useful pieces of masking tape. So don't ever throw things like that away again because you will be missing out on something really special. This is what I really wanted in the center spread. This was after, again, Andrea's, um, actually it was a presentation by a couple of people, including you, Barry, who had done Andrea's workshop on Koch. And you and Nancy Levitt were showing what you'd managed to do. And I was so fired with it. Um, because I'd never really done much with black letter at all in the past. And I have been to Klingspor Museum and I have seen these original pieces and have lots of photographs that I took at the time. So I thought I will do a Rudolf Koch for a center spread. And this is written without any lines, not even one at the top. I used my the, the edge of the page as the, the guideline for the, the first line of lettering. What follows was written copying text in a language I don't speak. I understand a little bit of it, but um, anybody who is a German speaker, if they look at this too closely, will find there are words missing and misspelt. Um, so don't. Just look at it from the texture and pattern point of view. But it's another one of those with these orange bits on that if you remove, you realise just what what impact, tiny little impact is, is needed to hold this thing in place across this spread. And it had to be rusty orange color again. So I wrote, I tried to write from the heart like Koch did to give his letters feeling, um, varying the texture by having wider uh, letters where it was appropriate, usually where there were capitals that could be extended. And from there, we change the tenor of it back to the gestural letter forms. This was another blank page. And I realized I hadn't done any drawn letters as such. So these letters here were created by drawing the counter spaces and then filling those in with color and I used a graphite stick to link similar sort of movement from here through into this section. And here is the other end of the landscape with these compressed and some gestural marks, compressed letters and a colour scribble pattern. Uh, I'm sorry to have to keep bringing these pieces of white paper out, but it just illustrates my point that you have to look at every double page to see if there's anything else that's needed or something that you might actually want to cover over if it's too much. But in this case, I was left with this empty space, which I wanted to leave because putting anything in there would have spoiled that effect. So I experimented with putting something on this side, which would balance up this dark mark down here. And we're almost at the end with the last bit of brush lettering. And I'll illustrate again that without, it has no real bounce to it. It needs color 
at, as it's at the end of the book. Ta-da! You put some colour in and it pulls the whole thing together. And I rounded it off with this last page. It's a sort of G, but it could be an E. From break heart pass to round it off. So there you have it, folks. That is the Book of Scraps, Volume 2. So if you have any questions that you would like to throw at me, now's your chance. Fan, can we um, stop share and see what anybody has to say? I'll leave my other light on now. It's beginning to get dark now. <laughs> well, <clears throat> somebody posted in the chat that the that uh, layered brush that you showed us is also known as a grass brush. Is it? It's one I've never seen before. This this one. Yeah. With the ragged top, a grass yeah. brush. A grass brush, a watercolor grass brush. I think I have. Oh, yes. on I can understand why. Mm. Well, that was me, and and it is um, one of those special specialty watercolor brushes, typically that you find not in every art store, but um, so it, and it is specifically you know for painting little grasses and and yeah, and like that. So yeah. yeah, I understand. I had no idea when I bought it; it just looked interesting. I think Amazon carries it. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, it's, it's one of those things that you sit and look at for ages and wonder why you buy it, bought it, and then um, need to find an excuse to try it out. And that seemed a perfect way of using it. Because if you try to do that with an ordinary flat brush, you don't get that lovely drag effect in quite the same way. And then Linda is asking, what is the red-orange color that you used? Oh, in the gouache, it was just, a, I think, Scarlet Lake. No, or I'd have to go and look in my drawer. But it's a Windsor and Newton color, which is what I use most often. Might have been Orange Lake Deep. <laughs> it's another one that it's very, very similar to vermilion mm. in color. No, it it definitely wasn't. Oh, that. Not, or it's I like, don't, okay. don't have any. It might have been because I'd gone over the gouache with a, an orange colored pencil to mm. tone down the um, brightness of the red, if you like. Because mm. mm. I got a mixture of, of bits of card that were oh gf smith offcuts i think it's called grandee i can't remember now and the japanese tissue which was a, a rusty color rather than a, a pure red or a pure orange so i was just you know blurring the difference between the two trying to equate them and it was more interesting doing that than having the same color right the way through the book would have been boring by the time you'd gone past the third page of the same colour and the same kind of torn or cut paper. And then Gail Murray is asking if you could show the opening cover page again with how sure. it comes. Yes. Oh, the, how the uh, cover attaches. Was that what you wanted to, to uh, see? I suppose. Gail Murray, can you answer? Uh, Gail? Yes, yeah, the opening first two or three pages are the cover and the wrap, how that all came about. Oh, again. right. Okay. Well, if, if I go back to my document camera, we can do that. Thank you. No problem. If I take the book out, <laughs> can I get it back in again? I can show you the whole thing. 
well, as much of the whole thing as I can get underneath the camera. It's such an easy thing to do because there's no gluing involved and just a little bit of stitching. So you can see um, what I did was to measure the spine. You see where the stitching comes through. And incidentally, the stitching in this one wasn't an awful lot better than it was in the first one. So it's it's uh, a bit loose, shall we say. But you stitch through each section and you, you work from the back section through to the front and you end up by having a knot at the end. And as you finished stitching one, you take the needles through into the next the center of the next section and so it goes so you, you don't end up with anything very much along the spine edge but what i did was to measure this with a fold of um layout paper i think it was or tracing paper just folded it around the spine so you could work out how big to make this, um, let's put colored pencils either side, then you can see where, where the spine is. And you mark it all out in pencil on the inside and cut it to create flaps to hold the cover in there, but you cut out little v's at each cut so there's no bulging bits of extra paper or surplus paper and the same at the other end so careful measuring of even covers and flaps and fold-ins everywhere is required so you do need to be careful with it and then you place your book, not forgetting your thin card covers. Tuck in your first two pages and fold it in and or you know you don't need to do it like that fold that in first fold that over make sure your um, flaps for the spine are tucked in and then you can tuck in the pages at the end. I won't do it now. It, it is a, a tight fit and it fiddles and it'll, on, it'll only make me embarrassed. So <laughs> I'll leave it like that. But does, does that help, Gail? Yes, thank you very much. I appreciate that. No, I no. that Not a problem. Just um, reconstitute it. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, so if I stop that one and come back Diana to you. is asking, what is the pen-shaped Ikea triangular knife? This one? It's a, not a knife. Oh, that's a pen. It's a pen. What? You meant, Diana? Yeah, what is it called? And could you can I purchase one somewhere? One? Yes. Oh, it's a Tim's pen from John oh. Neal. One of it, this is the dagger style. But he makes several others. So this is a rounded one. What is the company name? It's called Tim's Pens. If you look on the John Neal Books website. John Neal. Okay, thank you so much. Very good pens. Is that a form of parallel pen? Not parallel. It's a folded ruling pen, I think, oh, is the yeah. correct description. Um, it's like a, a more mm, 
properly manufactured cola pen. <laughs> and the, these you can make yourself out of old tins. I've got dozens of them in various states of disrepair. But the nice thing about the ones that you make yourself, you can always cut new nibs. These are hardened steel, so they will be quite durable. And then Deborah is asking, what size vario tip brush was used? Oh, it says mm, it's a number 12. Okay. Can you see? Oh. Mm -hmm. Number 12. But they come in different sizes. It, it was Thank just you. that was. Um, the one that I thought would be most useful to me. Any others? Any other questions? I think I've gone through the whole chat. Or um, another look at anything in particular? Um, now, I didn't quite, maybe I missed this, Margaret. This is Raul. How do yes. you put the individual signatures together? Oh, um, stitched. It has, um, where are we? Sections are stitched, if I remember correctly. Um, let me swap. I'll go back to the document camera again. I started at the back section and you put the all the four needles through. I mean that you've only got two lengths of cotton or linen, whatever you're using to stitch, and you put all the needles through the middle to make these stitches and come out again uh, at Oh, it's a, I haven't done this for a long time, Raoul, so now you have embarrassed me. I can't tell you. I can't remember how I did it. But you go from one section, having collected all the pages, however many there are in each section, and you come out with the, the needle and go into the back of the next section along. So that stitch into the next section comes out in the middle and you cross over the threads and carry on through the book. I have a complete diagram of how to do that, but it's not within arm's length reach just at the moment. But that's how, how you do it. You stitch it with four needles and two, two threads um, going in through the back of the book. So you haven't got anything bulky here. I see. And you finish off with a knot right at the end. Okay. Does that make any sense? Yeah. I mean, we can talk about this at another juncture <laughs> when I've found the instructions, but it's um, what Josie found that she could cope with in terms of stitching. I see. There, there are a lot of uh notes in the chat saying that, that that it's coptic stitch um um i've never done before but i don't, I don't know that it is strictly coptic okay. stitch no. because then okay. you get a much more um noticeable chain stitch pattern across the the back of the spine so it, it's a sort of but not an actual Coptic. I mean, I can check my notes. I've got, um, have done both of those. Um, it allows you to open the book flat rather than the stab bindings, which don't. And then Susan Mentis is asking if you can clarify the final book size and the paper Sorry. that. Oh, well, it was whatever, whatever was on, um, <laughs> I've worked on. Um, mm, well, so what did you end up with? It, it's hard to tell. Um, is it a small book? Like, 
eight by 10 or, yeah, okay. Let me get my ruler to it. The trouble with having black paper, let me measure this one. In inches, it is eight by, Sorry, the numbers have worn off my ruler. <laughs> it looks like five and eight by five and three quarters. So it it's not done with the pages um, at any drawn particular size. I, I folded up my practice sheets when I found the ones that I wanted to use, and literally just folded them in half and. So the book size evolves to it does. Work it, right? Absolutely. Yes. That's yeah. a very good way of describing yes. it. Okay. Evolves. Yeah. So it just gives us a context. It's not a huge book, but it was the paper no. that we worked with. But what I, have, to coordinate. what I have done, um, incidentally, which is what we will be doing at the end of the workshops that start next month, is um, Yukimi Anand's um, no stitch binding which I used for other, this one is for Carl Rohr's workshop that he did in England in 2010. And it, I ran out of paper, so I had to make a different colored spine, but that is also, uh, it allows you to open it flat like that. And this, this is a European size A3, folded to a4 so this is bigger you could do it with a much bigger book it's just that uh the two that i've done happen to be small are your papers predominantly like an arches text wove or a blend of water like what do you practice on the most when you're doing Generally your boring? speaking um i use a sketchbook paper made by Canson, which is quite lightweight, but it has a really nice texture to it. If I can lay hands on it. Hmm. This one, which is extra white, and there's another one which is off-white, which is really rather nice. So it, hold, it holds up to binding. That's why I was asking, too. Uh, oh, yes. Um, put it flat, otherwise it bows out. Um, yes, it does. Um, what does it say the weight of it is? Probably won't. Oh, it's 61 pounds or 90 grams. Yes, yeah. So it, it's pretty good. It has a tooth to it, which is useful when you're using color, um, colored pencils or graphite pencils, or even pastels, for instance. Well, thank you for sharing that. It just helps to know how your your book evolved and formed. So, excellent. Oh, well, it was, you know, ad hoc is the way, way I can describe <laughs> it. It was literally whatever came to hand. There are some very nice pages in, in here. Um, these two thicker pages that I showed you in the first book are actually Cardi um, Indian papers, really very thick and very substantial, quite hard to bind in. And you can only use maybe two sheets per section because it's quite so hefty. But the... Um, sketchbook paper or drawing paper um, is lighter weight so you can afford to use um, or end up with 12 or 16 pages in a section just depends just match the, the the thickness of the section and use anything I mean I showed you that old packing paper be inventive I mean that was what what was such fun um, and why it took me so long to finish it, because I became so completely absorbed by the whole thing. Um, 
my husband kept coming up to the studio and said, you know, it's lunchtime. I said, why? Have you done something for lunch? And he said, no, I'm waiting for you to come. <clears throat> yeah, needless to say, he got his lunch. But it's it's great when you can come across a just something that grabs your imagination like that did um, and end up with something that's desperately badly stitched together but represents a long time of concentrated creative thought um, that you can remind yourself about each time you look at the book um, and especially if you're going through a, a, a blank creative patch going back to something like that that worked um and held your interest for a long time just reminds you of that that you're not completely out of ideas already mm -hmm. any other questions no well, Barry, you wanted to me to say a few words about uh, yeah, in a minute, but not surprisingly, Margaret, there are many, many expressions of awe and gratitude. <laughs> so I know that everybody. Well, that's is, lovely. Thank you. Go home and start working on these because you've really unleashed the floodgates of inspiration for us all. Thank you. Uh, well, I hope it has because it certainly work wonders for me um my unspoken subtext to this book of scraps was making a silk purse out of a sow's ear <laughs> i think you've certainly succeeded <laughs> well if i have its job done then then thank you for your time listening and watching what i've had to say well, I like to think, you know, uh, sort of, sort of, but not quite in the post-COVID period, that out of the darkness comes light. And I think one of the great things that has happened has been Zoom and the bringing together of so many wonderful calligraphers from all over the world and given so many of us the opportunity to study with folks we otherwise would not have been able to. And on that note, we are thrilled that you accepted my request to come to the Society of Scribes. Yeah, not in person, which is a great pity, but oh, at boy, least I, <laughs> I, can, I can do it um, online. And that has been another challenge because, Barbara, you will remember, um, I think, and Nancy Campbell, too, doing free-range writing. I loved that class. Yeah, I well, have my book still. <laughs> that's what I'm doing for the, the Society of Scribes in New York starting Beautiful. next month. Um, so we have two hours each day and trying to work out a way of pacing it that I think will suit more or less anybody was really hard. Yes. Um, uh, splitting it up into sections across a whole month rather than bang straight in two days and we had such fun in that workshop in Los Angeles it was yes. really splendid and I have very happy memories of the weekend I spent with you apart from the fact that the um I think was it the microphone didn't work when I was doing the talk on the Friday night. <laughs> Probably. Uh, water under bridge, you know. <laughs> get used it's to always it. something. Yeah, nothing is ever simple, is it? <laughs> no. So no. yes, I I am doing this workshop, which is moving from um, traditional forms to more modern moving from monorhythm to polyrhythm to inventing your own alphabet which will be unique to you and nobody else on the planet <laughs> and it is a voyage of discovery you will 
find out things about your creativity that you never knew, that there are deep reserves within you that you just have to bring out for this workshop. Um, and it will be great fun, believe me. We will do a lot of laughing and a <laughs> lot of head scratching. Um, but uh, ultimately, we will be getting towards an alphabet of your own, even if it's not done in the four sessions. There will be plenty of things to do when the workshops are finished. And I will show you how to assemble one of these no stitch books. So it will be action packed right from the word go. And I hope everybody will enjoy it as much as the Society for Calligraphy Ladies did in 2015. And registration will open very soon because the workshop is coming up very soon. You're not kidding. <laughs> Please note, as I mentioned before, that the 17th of September has been changed to the 16th. So note that. That's correct. There's only one Sunday, and that's the, the 10th of September. Right. So we, we set off with a weekend, a Saturday and a Sunday, two hours on each. So it will, will get you going and um, consolidate the ideas behind the workshop. And then you have a week to catch up between the last two sessions. And the class is limited to only 12 participants. So you better be at your computer right away to, to register. <laughs> okay. So if there are no more questions, I guess we've finished for this evening. So can I just say thank you to Barry for hosting this, for inviting me in the first place. And for dear Fan, who is the technical wizard behind the whole thing, holding it all together, which means I don't have to worry about anything. We're nominating him for an Academy Award. Absolutely. You have my vote. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so thanks, chaps. It's been great. And thank you to all who have been taking part and watching tonight. Thank you oh. so much, Margaret. It was really wonderful. You're As more I, than welcome, Barry. I knew it would be. Thank you, Margaret. Just see you all. So you. I'll say bye bye and maybe see you sometime. Hope so. Thank you. Thank you so much. It You're was welcome. very inspirational. Thank you. You're very welcome. If I can share some of my ludicrous enthusiasm with other people for this <laughs> mad art. I love it. I love it. Anytime. <laughs> okay. Bye, folks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.